Chapter Eight of Windsor Castle, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vicki Rands, Windsor Castle, Book One, by William H. Ainsworth. Chapter Eight of Tristram Lindwood, the Old Forester, and his granddaughter Mabel of the peril in which the Lady Anne Boleyn was placed during the chase, and by whom she was rescued. In consequence of the announcement that a grand hunting party would be held in the forest, all the verderers, rangers, and keepers assembled at an early hour on the fourth day, after the King's arrival at Windsor, in an open space on the west side of the great avenue, where a wooden stand was erected, canopied over, with green boughs, and festooned with garlands of flowers, for the accommodation of the lady anne boleyn and her dames who it was understood would be present at the chase at a little distance from the stand an extensive covert was fenced round with stout poles to which nets were attached so as to form a hay or preserve where the game intended for the royal sport was confined and though many of the animals thus brought together were of hostile natures they were all so terrified and seemingly so conscious of the danger impending over them that they did not molest each other the foxes and martens of which there were abundance slunk into the brushwood with the hares and rabbits but left their prey untouched the harts made violent efforts to break forth and entangling their horns in the nets were with difficulty extricated and driven back while the timid does not daring to follow them stood warily watching the results of the struggle amongst the antlered captives was a fine buck which having been once before hunted by the king was styled a hart royal and this noble animal would certainly have effected his escape if he had not been attacked and driven back by morgan fenwolf who throughout the morning's proceedings displayed great energy and skill the compliments bestowed on fenwolf for his address by the chief verderer excited the jealousy of some of his comrades and more than one asserted that he had been assisted in his task by some evil being and that bawsey herself was no better than a familiar spirit in the form of a hound morgan fenwolf scouted these remarks and he was supported by some others among the keepers who declared that it required no supernatural aid to accomplish what he had done that he was nothing more than a good huntsman who could ride fast and boldly that he was skilled in all the exercises of the chase and possessed a staunch and well-trained hound the party then sat down to breakfast beneath the trees and the talk fell upon her and the hunter and his frequent appearance of late in the forest for most of the keepers had heard of or encountered the spectral huntsman and while they were discussing this topic and a plentiful allowance of cold meat bread ale and mead at the same time two persons were seen approaching along a vista on the right who specially attracted their attention and caused morgan fenwolf to drop the hunting knife with which he was carving his viands and start to his feet the newcomers were an old man and a comely young damsel the former though nearer seventy than sixty was still hale and athletic with fresh complexion somewhat tanned by the sun and a keen gray eye which had lost nothing of its fire he was habited in a stout leathern doublet hose of the same material and boots rudely fashioned out of untanned ox-hide and drawn above the knee in his girdle was thrust a large hunting knife a horn with a silver mouthpiece depended from his shoulder and he wore a long bow and a quiver full of arrows at his back a flat bonnet made of fox skin and ornamented with a raven's wing covered his hair which was as white as silver but it was not upon this old forester for such his attire proclaimed him that the attention of the beholders and of morgan fenwolf in especial was fixed but upon his companion amongst the many lovely and high-born dames who had so recently graced the procession to the castle were few if any comparable to this lowly damsel her dress probably owing to the pride felt in her by her old relative was somewhat superior to her station a tightly laced green kirtle displayed to perfection her slight but exquisitely formed figure a gown of orange-colored cloth 
sufficiently short to display her small ankles and a pair of green buskins embroidered with silver together with a collar of the whitest and finest linen though shamed by the neck it concealed and fastened by a small clasp completed her attire her girdle was embroidered with silver and her sleeves were fastened by eyelets of the same metal how proud old tristan linwood seems of his granddaughter remarked one of the keepers and with reason replied another mabel linwood is the comeliest lass in berkshire ay merry she is rejoined the first speaker and to my thinking she is a fairer and sweeter flower than any that blooms in yon stately castle the flower that finds so much favour in the eyes of our royal hal not excepted have a care gabriel lapp observed another keeper recollect that mark fighton the butcher was hanged for speaking slightingly of the lady anne boleyn and you may share his fate if you disparage her beauty nah i meant not to disparage the lady anne replied gabriel hal may marry her when he will and divorce her as soon afterwards as he pleases for aught i care if he marries fifty wives i shall like him all the better the more the merrier say i but if he sets eyes on mab linwood it may somewhat unsettle his love for the lady anne tush gabriel said morgan fenwolf darting an angry look at him what business have you to insinuate that the king would heed other than the lady of his love you are jealous morgan fenwolf rejoined gabriel with a malignant grin we all know you are in love with mabel yourself and we all know likewise that mabel will have nothing to say to you cried another keeper while the others laughed in chorus come and sit down beside us morgan and finish your breakfast but the keeper turned moodily away and hied towards tristram linwood and his granddaughter the old forester shook him cordially by the hand and after questioning him as to what had taken place and hearing how he had managed to drive the heart royal into the hay clapped him on the shoulder and said thou art a brave huntsman morgan i wish mab could only think as well of thee as i do to this speech mabel not only paid no attention but looked studiously another way i am glad your grandfather has brought you out to see the chase to-day mabel observed morgan fenwolf i came not to see the chase but the king she replied somewhat petulantly it is not every fair maid who would confess so much observed fenwolf frowning then i am franker than some of my sex replied mabel but who is the strange man looking at us from behind that tree grandfather i see no one replied the old forester neither do i added morgan fenwolf with a shudder you are wilfully blind rejoined mabel but see the person i mention stalks forth now perhaps he is visible to you both and as she spoke a tall wild-looking figure armed with a hunting spear emerged from the trees and advanced toward them the garb of the newcomer somewhat resembled that of a forester but his arms and lower limbs were destitute of covering and appeared singularly muscular while his skin was swarthy as that of a gypsy his jet-black hair hung in elf-locks over his savage-looking features in another moment he was beside them and fixed his dark piercing eyes on mabel in such a manner as to compel her to avert her gaze what brings you here this morning tristram linwood he demanded in a hoarse imperious tone the same motive that brought you valentine hagthorne replied the old forester to see the royal chase this i suppose is your granddaughter pursued hagthorne ay replied tristram bluntly strange i should never have seen her before rejoined the other she is very fair be ruled by me friend tristram take her home again if she sees the king ill will come of it you know or should know his character hagthorne advises well interposed fenwolf mabel will be better at home but she has no intention of returning at present replied mabel you brought me here for pastime dear grandfather and will not take me back at the recommendation of this strange man 
Content you, child, content you, replied Tristram kindly. You shall remain where you are. You will repent it, cried Hackthorn, and hastily darted among the trees he disappeared from view. Affecting to laugh at the occurrence, though evidently annoyed by it, the old forester led his granddaughter towards the stand, where he was cordially greeted by the keepers, most of whom, while expressing their pleasure at seeing him, strove to render themselves agreeable in the eyes of Mabel. From this scene Morgan Fenwolf kept aloof, and remained leaning against a tree, with his eyes riveted upon the damsel. He was roused from his reverie by a slight tap upon the shoulder, and turning at the touch, beheld Valentine Hagthorne. Obedient to a sign from the latter, he followed him amongst the trees, and they both plunged into a dell. An hour or two after this, when the sun was higher in the heavens, and the dew dried upon the greensward, the king and a large company of lords and ladies rode forth from the upper gate of the castle, and taking their way along the great avenue, struck off on the right when about halfway up it, and shaped their course towards the hay. A goodly sight it was to see this gallant company riding beneath the trees, and pleasant was it also to listen to the blithe sound of their voices, amid which Anne Boleyn's musical laugh could be plainly distinguished. Henry was attended by his customary band of archers and yeomen of the guard, and by the Duke of Shoreditch and his followers. On reaching the hay, the king dismounted, and assisting the Lady Anne from her steed, ascended the stand with her. He then took a small and beautifully fashioned bow from an attendant, and stringing it, presented it to her. "'I trust this will not prove too strong for your fair hands,' he said. "'I will make shift to draw it,' replied Anne, raising the bow and gracefully pulling the string. "'Would I could!' wound your majesty as surely as i shall hit the first row that passes that were a needless labour rejoined henry seeing that you have already stricken me to the heart you should cure the wound you have already made sweetheart not inflict a new one at this juncture the chief verderer mounted on a powerful steed and followed by two keepers each holding a couple of staghounds in leash rode up to the royal stand, and placing his horn to his lips, blew three long moots from it. At the same moment part of the network of the hay was lifted up, and a roebuck set free. By the management of the keepers the animal was driven past the royal stand, and Anne Boleyn, who had drawn an arrow nearly to the head, let it fly with such good aim that she pierced the buck to the heart. A loud shout from the spectators rewarded the prowess of the fair huntress, and Henry was so enchanted that he bent the knee to her and pressed her hand to his lips. Satisfied, however, with the achievement, Anne prudently declined another shot. Henry then took a bow from one of the archers, and other rows being turned out, he approved upon them his unerring skill as a marksman meanwhile the hounds being held in leash kept up a loud and incessant baying and henry wearying of the slaughter-house sport turned to anne and asked her whether she was disposed for the chase she answered in the affirmative and the king motioned his henchmen to bring forward the steeds in doing this he caught sight of mabel who was standing with her grandsire among the keepers at a little distance from the stand and struck with her extraordinary beauty he regarded her for a moment intently and then called to gabriel lapp who chanced to be near him and demanded her name it is mabel linwood and to please your majesty replied gabriel she is granddaughter to old tristram lindwood who dwells at black nest near the lake at the farther extremity of windsor forest and who was forester to your royal father king henry the seventh of blessed memory ha is it so cried henry but he was prevented from further remark by anne boleyn who perceiving how his attention was attracted suddenly interposed your majesty spoke of the chase she said impatiently but perhaps you have found other pastime more diverting 
not so not so sweetheart he replied hastily there is a heart royal in the hay said gabriel lapp is it your majesty's pleasure that i set him free it is good fellow it is replied the king and as gabriel hastened to the knitted fence-work and prepared to drive forth the heart henry assisted anne boleyn who could not help exhibiting some slight jealous pique to mount her steed and having sprung into his own saddle they waited the liberation of the buck which was accomplished in a somewhat unexpected manner separated from the rest of the herd the noble animal made a sudden dart towards gabriel and upsetting him in his wild career darted past the king and made towards the upper part of the forest in another instant the hounds were uncoupled and at his heels while henry and anne urged their steeds after him the king shouted at the top of his lusty voice the rest of the royal party followed as they might and the woods resounded with their joyous cries the heart royal proved himself worthy of his designation dashing forward with extraordinary swiftness he rapidly gained upon his pursuers for though henry by putting his courser to his utmost speed could have kept him near he did not choose to quit his fair companion in this way they scoured the forest until the king seeing they should be speedily distanced commanded sir thomas wyatt who with the dukes of suffolk and norfolk was riding close behind him to cross by the lower ground on the left and turn the stag wyatt instantly obeyed and plunging his spurs deeply into the, his horse's side started off at a furious pace and was soon after seen shaping his rapid course through a devious glade meanwhile henry and his fair companion rode on without relaxing their pace until they reached the summit of a knoll crowded by an old oak and beech tree and commanding a superb view of the castle where they drew in the rain from this eminence they could witness the progress of the chase as it continued in the valley beyond an ardent lover of hunting the king watched it with the deepest interest rose in his saddle and uttering various exclamations showed from his impatience that he was the only restrained by the stronger passion of love from joining it ere long stag hounds and huntsmen were lost amid a thicket and nothing could be distinguished but a distant bang and shouts at last even the sounds died away henry who had ill brooked the previous restraint now grew so impatient that anne begged him to set off after them when suddenly the cry of hounds burst upon their ears and the heart was seen issuing from the dell closely followed by his pursuers the affrighted animal to the king's great satisfaction made his way directly towards the spot where he was stationed but on reaching the side of the knoll and seeing his new foes he darted off on the right and tried to regain the thicket below but he was turned by another band of keepers and again driven towards the knoll scarcely had sir thomas wyatt reined in his steed by the side of the king than the hart again appeared bounding up the hill anne boleyn who had turned her horse's head to obtain a better view of the hunt alarmed by the animal's menacing appearance tried to get out of his way but it was too late hemmed in on all sides and driven to desperation by the cries of hounds and huntsmen in front the hart lowered his horns and made a furious push at her dreadfully alarmed anne drew in the reins so suddenly and sharply that she almost pulled her steed back upon his haunches and in trying to avoid the stag's attack caught hold of sir thomas wyatt who was close beside her in all probability she would have received some serious injury from the infuriated animal who was just about to repeat his assault and more successfully when a bolt from a crossbow discharged by morgan fenwolf who suddenly made his appearance from behind the beech tree brought him to the ground but anne boleyn escaped one danger only to encounter another equally serious on seeing her fling herself into the arms of sir thomas wyatt henry regarded her in stern displeasure for a moment and then calling angrily to his train 
without so much as deigning to inquire whether she had sustained any damage from the accident or making the slightest remark upon her conduct rode sullenly towards the castle end of chapter eight recording by vicky rands